Signal is a podcast by the Bucks County Beacon. I'm your host and the Beacon's Editor-in-Chief, Cyril McAleco. Twice a month, we'll use this space to shine a light on the right-wing extremist currents streaming through Bucks County and beyond. We'll talk to guests who will help listeners navigate these perilous political waters by providing insight, analysis, and organizing solutions so that we can steer the community toward calmer, saner, progressive routes. On this episode, I welcome Dr. Kate Connolly to the show. Kate is a writer, historian, and activist. She is a biographer of Sylvia Pankhurst. Her book, Sylvia Pankhurst, Suffragette Socialist and the Scourge of Empire, was published by Pluto Press in 2013. In 2019, she edited and introduced Pankhurst's previously unpublished manuscript about her suffrage lecture tours in North America, now published under the title, A Suffragette in America, Reflections on Prisoners, Pickets, and Political Change. Kate is currently researching the links between labor movement activists in the United States and Pankhurst's organization, the East London Federation of Suffragettes. 20 years ago, Kate was one of the leaders of the school strikes against the war in Iraq. She has been a campaigner ever since. She is a member of the socialist organization Counterfire and contributes regularly to its website. Kate works as a lecturer at the London centers of several US-based universities, including Arcadia University near Philadelphia. Hi, Kate. Welcome to The Signal. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, So this International Women's Day, UN Women and the United Nations are celebrating under the theme Digital, A-L-L, Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality. They're calling on governments, activists, the private sector um, to power on their efforts to make the digital world safer, more inclusive and more equitable. But how does this corporate conceptualization comport with the history and political aspirations of the first International Women's Day? It has very little to do with it. Um, In fact, I would argue that it's it's quite a contradiction. Um, And, you know, the, the first International Women's Day was set up by socialist women. Um, It emerged from a call that was made by Clara Zetkin, a really famous um, German socialist in 1910 at an international gathering of women in Copenhagen. And the reason for creating International Women's Day in the first place, or International Working Women's Day, as it was first called, um, was because the contemporary feminist movements were largely focused on the kind of changes that were going to primarily benefit uh, middle and upper class women. And they had very little connection with um, working women's movements or the kind of changes that working women wanted to see in their lives. So this is why Clara Zetkin called for an International Working Women's Day in the first place. Um, It was in order for working class women to mobilise and to mobilise against a system that was um, that was oppressing and exploiting them. Um, So it was it called for an anti-capitalist mobilisation. And so I think there's something um, very contradictory today about an International Women's Day that various, you know, any corporation these days pretty much can get behind International Women's Day so-called. It doesn't really cost them very much. They can put something out on Twitter, they can hashtag it, um, and and they've done their job. And it's very much framed as um, something for everyone, but there's n- little to no focus um, these days, certainly not prominently, on working class women, what working class women want, um, the kind of changes that that we want to see. Um, So I think it's it's quite a travesty, really, when we think about the really the revolutionary origins of the day and what's been done to it. Great. Um, So the suffrage movement at the time was the backbone of the feminist movement. But just as there's always been competing visions of feminism throughout history, 
there were also competing visions of what women's suffrage should look like. One woman who had a more radical vision of women's suffrage was Sylvia Pankhurst, someone who you're an expert on. Um, you wrote that she was a leading suffragette, suffragette who broke away from the elitism dominating the movement to, embra to embrace a more radical vision of the campaign that put working class women at the forefront of the fight for the vote. Can you um, tell listeners how you first became interested in Sylvia Pankhurst and then just give us a thumbnail sketch of who she was and her role in the suffrage movement in the United Kingdom? Sure. Um, I think, like a lot of people, I first heard about the suffragettes from my mom. Um, and that was, I think, partly because the only women in history that I knew about were queens and princesses. Um, so we're still quite a, a feudal country here. Um, and she wanted me to know about um, some kind of better heroines, really. And so she told me about the suffragettes. And I just thought they were so inspiring um, and I wanted to know much, much more about them. But it was it was Sylvia Pankhurst whose life um, and activism resonated with me um, because she broke from um, from the elitism of of the campaign. Um, and that's that's so important um, at the time suffrage campaigners were divided about about how to campaign for for the right to vote in britain um that division was largely on the question of class because um the vote was granted on the basis of how much property you had so this raised a, a dilemma for suffrage campaigners do you campaign for votes for women on the same terms as men have it um or do you campaign for votes for everybody um and that's the way that the the campaign divided. It's kind of analogous, I suppose, to some of the divisions in the States, particularly around race, um, where you get a whole section of the suffrage movement adopting an explicitly racist argument in, in an effort to win votes for a small group of women. And in Britain, what we have is the suffrage movement um, adopting a position of votes for women on the same terms as men, which would have excluded all of the poorest women in society, the women who so desperately needed um, political and empowerment, but also empowerment in many other senses as well. And Sylvia Pankhurst challenged that. And she went to East London, um, which then as now is one of the most working class parts of London. And she organised a militant campaign um, in which working class women were at the forefront um, of not just demanding votes for everybody, um, but also demanding social and and far-reaching economic changes in society as well. Um, and those those demands had been dismissed by by the women at the top of the movement. They said that was making it too. It was dragging politics into it. Um, and of course, their own movement was political. But if if your politics kind of harmonise with the status quo on, on every other aspect, you don't notice that it's political, um, I guess, was was the difference. But for working class women, the, the changes they wanted to see in their lives, um, you know, fighting against unemployment, fighting against poverty wages, fighting for safety um, for, for their children, decent pay at work, decent respect at work, um, you know, very high levels of sexual harassment and stuff in the, the kind of factories that they were working in. All of these questions were inseparable from their their status as women, inseparable from the struggle that they were, were waging. They were separable for upper class women. They were seen as different issues, but not so for working class women. And so what Sylvia Pankhurst does is to is to create um, a campaign that is led by by working women. Um, and that that's becomes incredibly powerful and it has a very, very important legacy. Um, her organization, her organization was in fact expelled um, from the main suffrage organization uh, at the beginning of 1914. Very painfully for her, it was she was expelled by her own mother and her older sister, who were the leaders of that campaign. Um, but this means that it was only an independent organization for a few months before the outbreak of the First World War. But interestingly, it's 
Sylvia Pankhurst's organisation that doesn't give up campaigning for women's rights um, and on a whole range of other issues that working women wanted to fight on during the First World War. Whereas the movement led by her, the more elitist movement led by her mother and older sister, um, essentially did reveal their political priorities on the outbreak of war. They suspended campaigning for women's rights and they decided that defending the British Empire was more important. Um, and so it's incredibly important that Sylvia Pankhurst had an independent organisation that didn't follow in, in those those chauvinistic footsteps um, and and repeat those those kind of mistakes. I don't know if that answered the full no, that, thing that's that you correct. asked. But, um... but yeah, and, and just kind of um, moving forward, you know, Sylvia was actually at the first International Women's Day in Boston in 1911. It's the first year that she toured the U.S. to kind of raise awareness of the suffragette movement um, going on in the U.K. And then, you know, a few weeks later, um, there was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory um, that killed 146 workers, um, which you've pointed out in your writing that had an um, had a profound impact on her, you know, and then, and then during her tour, she also met with striking laundry workers, um, visited political prisoners in Philadelphia and Chicago and visited the South and, you know, experienced, uh, you know, American racism firsthand. H how did her travels in the U.S. in 1911 and then again in 1912 when she came back, um, you know, affect her politically and, and potentially radicalize her? I think they were hugely important. She was invited over to talk about the British struggle um, and to sell a, a book that she'd just written about it. And probably she was sent a little bit um, by her mother and older sister because she was a bit of a troublemaker in their eyes and they they were quite happy to have a, a, an ocean separating them for, for a while. Um, it meant she couldn't be in the limelight, she couldn't go to prison um, or anything like that. But this also meant that she was, um, for the first time as a political activist, at quite a remove from her family and, and their control. So she was... Um, undertaking this tour independently she went uh, she went on her own um she's you know relatively young woman at that time so it was an incredibly um courageous and, and brave thing to do um and, and shows real kind of independence of uh, of mind and it really is a chance i think for her to explore where she is politically and some of her political objections to where the suffrage movement was was going and to try and work those out. Um, and this this kind of happens in a number of ways. One is that she's she finds that audiences are expecting to hear about the kind of horrors of campaigning for women's rights in the old country, uh, as it were. And they are happy to understand the struggle as um, a much harder fight in Britain. As you know, there was a lot of militancy at the time. Women were going to prison. They were hunger striking. They were being force fed. Um, all of these horrendous things. And this was attributed to the kind of political backwardness of Britain. You know, semi feudal country. Um, but she also encountered the attitude that, oh, well, the United States isn't like that. It doesn't it doesn't suffer the same problems. Capitalism here is far more modern and, and far more developed. Um, and so she makes a study of that. She, she sort of um, starts to take control of the tour. She gets very bored of it because she's invited to speak by some of the wealthiest sections of society that, that favor women's suffrage um she's expected to lecture in an evening dress um and, and sylvia pankhurst had no interest in clothes uh, or or anything like that at all um and she starts to then investigate what conditions are like in the united states for for women um but of course she's very much interested in also the question of class um, the question of racism as you say and this is what she starts to do. So what she sees is that 
it's not that American capitalism has solved all of these problems. And indeed, that she sees that as a very, very dangerous argument that could um, undermine the campaign for, for women's rights, because if capitalism is just going to do it for everybody, then we just have to sit back and wait to get rich. Um, but what her exploration proves is that American capitalism um, relies upon exploitation on a massive scale and that exploitation is intensified um, by the existing oppressions in society um, so that it makes use of um, women's cheap labour um, to exploit them even more. And so what she sees um, is that if women are going to be empowered, um, then they have to fight both against the, their special subordinate position in society um, and against capitalism um, as well. So she sees these things as, as linked and that's really behind her making the case for political emancipation. But very much she um, links up the causes of the oppressed and sees they have they have common cause. So that I think is is hugely important in terms of um, in terms of her political development. Um, but she also she she also encounters positive examples in the United States as well. She encounters women working in the Women's Trade Union League. She goes to when she goes to Chicago, she encounters um, a, a phase of industrial militancy led by women, many of them from immigrant backgrounds, that really lasts from from 1909 up to 1915. And she she's there at the the end of the garment workers' strike in Chicago, and she sees the way in which working class women are organizing, and the ways in which some organizers, some labor organizers, um, are able to help them to kind of articulate their own demands and to to self-organize and I think that's very inspirational I think um, some of those examples are things that she takes back with her um, and starts to implement in Britain um, and this to me really answered a, a big question that wasn't asked enough I think there was we had in our heads the understanding that Sylvia Pankhurst tried to do things differently because she was a socialist. Um, but just because you're a socialist doesn't necessarily mean you know what to do about it. And she sees all of the problems in the British suffrage movement, but it's so difficult for her to know what to do. How do you um, change that organization's policy when it's led by your family members? And how do you do so? How do you even raise a word of criticism when all of the, well, not all of, but, you know, huge sections of the press are demonising those women when they're, when they're being persecuted. You want to stand side by side with them and not in any way undermine them. And I think what she sees in America, particularly in, in the most radical versions of the Settlement House movement, amongst the most radical activists in the Women's Trade Union League, are modes of organising that she can put into practice in East London. So I, I think it's hugely inspirational. Can you talk a little bit about the militant direct action um, that she embraced? Yeah. Sylvia Pankhurst's test for militancy was always, is it going to win public support or not? That was for her the crucial question because she didn't have a vision of emancipation being won by a small group of people on behalf of everybody else, or more likely just for themselves. Um, Sylvia Pankhurst understood, I think, that if women's suffrage was going to be won on a broad democratic basis, it was going to come through a mass movement. And therefore what the women's suffrage movement needed to do was to win mass support. And what Sylvia Pankhurst distinguished between was the kind of militancy the early militancy of the campaign, which was actually very inspirational and people understood that women were taking a courageous stand by and large, whether that be, you know, right at the beginning, getting up in a public meeting and demanding that your question was answered, um, all the way through to um, 
hunger striking in prison as a demand for treatment as a political prisoner um, to resisting being forcibly fed. Um, and she smashed windows herself. Um, so she, she did throw stones through, uh, through panes of glass and, and attacked private property, um, which, of course, was the whole basis on which the franchise was given in this country. Where she disagreed with militancy was where it was intended to alienate people. And that was really the arson campaign, so burning things down. And she's, there were sort of two things, I suppose. Um, on the one hand, it was articulated by her, her older sister, Christabel, as a punishment on the British public for not sufficiently supporting the suffrage movement. Um, and she wrote quite a sort of notorious editorial about this, saying, this is your punishment. Um, and maybe maybe you'll support us now. Or, um, on the other hand, uh, she felt people couldn't understand the tactic because um, when arson was committed, the women tried to get away um, without being without being spotted, without being caught by the police. Um, f- because arson is an attack on private property, and this is the. Um, the thing the British state holds most sacred to be on, you know, above everything else. For arson, you get a very long prison sentence. So they would try and escape um, and not get caught. And she said that that's not something that um, people understand as as heroic or courageous. Um, She herself did. She understood why women were doing that, what they were risking. But she said that's not cutting through. So for her, that was the test. Is this something that's going to bring more people on board and make the movement something that they can be part of as well? Or is it going to alienate them and promote a movement that relies on a smaller and smaller group of activists? That's elitist, but it's also self-defeating. And she was thinking very practically about how are we going to win? And if you rely on a very small elite group of women, um, you're, you're not going to win. Like uh, you mentioned earlier, the, you know, the first um, International Women's Day, you know, had a very kind of anti-war um, component to it. And uh, Sylvia Pankhurst, um, she was an anti-imperialist. She, um, you know, she was opposed to colonialism and to the British Empire. Could you kind of flesh that out a little more for listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Um, she was a lifelong anti-imperialist, and it's a really important part of her politics. As I said, in 1914, um, when the British state joins the First World War, this poses a question for all radical campaigners in Britain. Are they going to suspend their campaigns um, and rally round the flag? Or are they going to continue campaigning? Um, Are they going to try and jeopardise the war effort? And that's what that's what Sylvia Pankhurst tried to do. Um, her organisation became explicitly anti-war. Um, they supported conscientious objectors, um, things things like that. She supported the Easter Rising in Ireland. So in Dublin in 1916, there was an uprising against British rule, and this was, you know. Um, well, well, the leaders were were shot as as traitors, um, and the British state tried to stop news of the uprising even getting out. Sylvia Pankhurst um, not only nailed her colours to the mast by by supporting the uprising. You know, she had criticisms of it, but she knew whose side she was on, um, so she publicly supported it. Not only that, but she sent a journalist, a young woman who worked on her newspaper into Dublin to defy the censorship during wartime and to get out news of the repression by the British state in Ireland and what that was what that was really like. So she supported freedom for Ireland. Um, she supported um, Indian independence from, from the British Empire. It, this was a very, very important part of her politics and she you know she understood anti-imperialism as an integral part of the democratic struggle um she didn't think that 
um, you could you could win democracy um, whilst collaborating with with imperialism. Imperialism, by its very nature, um, is a denial of people to de- denial of people's right to determine their own future and to their their own political self expression. Um, so she she always resisted the imperialism of um, the British state. And um, that continued all the way, all the way through her life, um, right up to the last cause of her life, which was fighting for Ethiopia's independence. Um, in 1935, the um, fascist Italy invaded Ethiopia, with uh, essentially appeased by by Britain and, and France, who really saw no difference between uh, Mussolini's invasion and uh, and their own scramble for Africa. And Sylvia Pankhurst, from that moment onwards, dedicated the rest of her life to, well, first of all, fighting um, the fascist occupation in in Ethiopia, um, and then to um, well, fighting the the designs of the British Empire and fighting for for Ethiopia's independence. And her last, um, you know, she she was a newspaper editor pretty much all of her life, but. Um, her, the newspaper that she that she published, um, the New Times and Ethiopia News, which got which got news out of Ethiopia, um, reported the the anti fascist struggle there, was of great inspiration to um, Pan Africanists and to those fighting British imperialism around the world. Um, so it was absolutely core to to her politics. And I guess the last thing I should should say on that is is to talk about her support for the for the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, um, which for her represented a, a more uh, a superior form of democracy, a more direct democracy, um, had the intention of it, of empowering the Russian working class and peasants, and this of course was um, targeted by the British state. And she threw all of her efforts again um, behind letting people know what was what was happening in Russia and trying and in fact successfully really stopping the the British state from intervening in the way that it wanted to in in Russia. So she was an incredibly important anti-imperialist and anti-war activist. What organizing and movements are you seeing today in the UK or globally that continues the working class and anti-war tradition of uh, Sylvia Pankhurst's feminism? Well, um, I'm involved in um, in the Stop the War Coalition in, in Britain, and this was an organisation founded in 2001 and initially campaigned against the war on terror. Um, and I think that's that's a very important um it's a very important organization it's a hugely important movement and it very much adopted um in some ways sylvia pankhurst's view but the view of you know many other socialists besides um many other anti-war the most effective anti-war campaigners i i would argue that um that mass mobilizations are are absolutely crucial in um in trying to stop war um and in in fighting for peace you know and in this country it organized the the biggest demonstration that, that we've ever had so i think the the stop the war coalition which uh, still campaigns against war um over 20 years later in this country is is a very important organization and in in some ways um obviously owes a debt to to many anti and there's you know I, I should say there's many different kind of political strands inside the anti-war movement um but again, in, in some ways, that, that reflects the politics of, of people like Sylvia Pankhurst, who, um, you know, in her anti-war agitation, she w- worked with people who were, were anti-war for many, many different reasons. Um, so, so things like that. Obviously, we're facing what gets called a cost of living crisis. And, um, you know, so many of the, the questions that these, these campaigners were, were dealing with um, in the period just before the First World War, for example, unfortunately, are still with us, you know, and in some ways, I think that's a, that's a result of the vote not being granted in the way that that Pankhurst and her comrades were fighting for it to be won on, it was won on very different terms. Um, and so 
there are there are lots of campaigns um, against the efforts of the British government to make working class people um, pay for the cost of uh, of the current crisis. Um, there's a, an, another long standing campaign, the People's Assembly Against Austerity, um, you know, founded years ago to campaign against the austerity um, agenda of the government, but that unfortunately is is still relevant. Um, and this, you know, has, has organised again big demonstrations, has worked with the trade unions, things things like that. Um, the trade union struggle it, itself at the moment, the fact that we've been seeing so many groups of workers going on strike in Britain um, over over poverty wages, um, over the government's effort to make us pay um, and and bear the brunt of of the costs. I feel like that would have been so similar to, to Sylvia Panker, so similar to what she was seeing just before the First World War when so many groups of workers were um, were striking for better conditions and, and things like that. Okay, and finally, um, this next, this last question is a riff on what the New York Times asks authors in its By the Book interview series. You're organizing an International Women's Day protest. Which three feminists, in addition to Sylvia, dead or alive, would you want to organize it with? Oh, wow. Um, I'm organizing an International Women's Day protest. Which three feminists? That's a really tough one. In addition, so there's four speakers on the platform. So we've, we've already got Sylvia Pankhurst. I would want to have um, Rosa Luxemburg. Um, I know she doesn't often get get called a feminist um but i think her politics are well, she's kind of best friends with clara zetkin who proposed the first international women's day um i think her politics very much reflect the whole reason that international women's day was was created in the first place um she understood that liberation for uh the oppressed I was going to say minorities, women are uh, the majority in this, this country, but uh, for um, for the oppressed could only come through um, the revolutionary overthrow of, of capitalism. So um, we, I think we'd, we definitely have to have uh, Rosa Luxemburg there. Who else? Um, we'd have um, Rose Schneiderman um, from, um, from the US. Um, who is you know very much I mean, knew Sylvia Pankhurst, and um, she was very much involved in uh, the, the the American labor movement and and a real supporter of women's suffrage. Um, so she's she's one of these people who was able to connect up um, the struggle for women's emancipation um, to working class struggle, and so so never kind of made this. Um, something that was that was about narrow gains or, or narrow changes in in society but saw those things um as as integrally integrally linked um so so i'd like to have her um on the platform i think also we would have um it's interesting all of these women have crossed um national boundaries as well which is very much in the spirit of, of International Women's Day, of course. Um, but I, we'd have Claudia Jones, um, who is buried in London, um, but of course, you know, connects up um, so many of the, the places that, that we've been talking about and um, was uh, expelled, I believe, from, from the United States for... Um, for communist activities um, and is one of the founders of the Notting Hill Carnival in, in London, um, which, which to this day is a, um, a celebration of, um, of resistance um, and a, a statement of anti-racism. I think it's the largest street carnival in, in Europe. Um, and it's a, a lasting and uh wonderful legacy of of her activism but uh she's often not kind of credited or or not uh not talked about enough so um i'd want to have her on the platform as well 
Well, thanks so much um, for coming on to The Signal today and for giving us this history lesson. Um, and I hope you have a very militant and anti-imperialist International Women's Day, Kate. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. This has been The Signal, a podcast by the Bucks County Beacon. I'm Cyril McAlego, Editor-in-Chief and Host. For more progressive news, analysis, and opinion from Bucks County and beyond, go to www.buckscountybeacon.com. The Signal is produced by Kevin Mahoney of Raging Chicken Media. Intro-outro music by Moff et Tula, featuring Cartas a Felice, used with permission.